increasingly people are becoming aware of the situation and accepting that it is as, as we say it is. Um, and it's time to move into that B for buffer stage, which is to try and revise, revisit policies and try and protect against the worst of the things that could happen and engage with the opportunities. And I'm sure there'll be lots of them, but it's really hard to identify them until you move people away from that um, you know, addiction, a, a addiction to growth. So that is uh, very much my mission. So what we're going to do now is a really just more of similar graphs that you've already seen this morning, because I, I see my whole world through age structures and, mm -hmm. and basic graphs, but I always just say to like the students, you know, they're pictures, they're, they tell a story, don't, don't be scared of them. Um, to just drill down a little bit into the local area, uh, it might seem a bit um, boring because it's just <coughs> sort of repetitive, so what would be really good is, if people might sort of raise some issues that the graphics throw up for them, because I can only look at it really through the relatively simple lens of that's what the trends show us and um, what, do they, what do they mean for your particular local area. I, only you can know that. This slide, I've taken the, the latest Stats New Zealand projections, which as I say incorporates what's happened in Christchurch and um, also models that the assumptions for migration into some of the areas around like Timaru and Ashburton. Um, but even there you see, and I've got on some of the uh, slides that are coming up, the migration assumption for the particular areas. Um, but they still overall show generally a diminishing population, except for Christchurch there, which is projected to jump up between sort of well, from about 2016-21, and then starts to diminish away again. So that's the significant net migration assumption that's been built into that projection. It's not like birth rates going up or anything like that. Um, general picture there is, is just, I know it's numbers and your base populations are different sizes, so it's hard to say that it's actually unevenly spread. I've but when you work it out as a percentage change of your base population, that clearly the growth is spread unevenly. Uh, but the general picture is just that it is diminishing, but not as badly as um, the previous projections had shown. So this one shows only Waimati uh, finishing, and I haven't got, uh, um, what's the other one? Waitaki. I haven't got it on here uh, because, as I said, I was trying to figure out how to, where to build it in, and then I inadvertently left it off. Um, only got Waimati moving to uh, zero and back into negative growth over this projection period. Um, that's actually a reasonably healthy looking slide to me because you know, I was presenting to Waikato last week and uh, I've got um, four of their TAs going into decline quite, quite significantly and quite soon. A couple of them already declining. So. Uh, actually, that's South Waikato was one of them. So um, the overall picture there isn't too bad. Like I said, overall growth for this region be a bit uh, diverse in its spread, but still keeping going for a while. So all of those things that I've been talking about for you are a little bit off the radar at this point. Main thing is know your local drivers, which I've been saying differ. Um, think about their implications because some of them are potentially huge and, we, and there is no, as I say, literature on things like housing prices at the moment. And be aware of the limitations of projections. So on the one hand, I'm presenting on them. Yes, um, we know we model registered births and registered deaths. That's pretty guaranteed that they are pretty correct. The international migration that we can count it approximately, but people say they're going somewhere and then they might go somewhere else. The internal migration, we can really only get the good reading on it with the census. So we're a long way out from that census and um, the projections can be a bit furry around the edges. I mentioned this before, this is just another way of looking at it, that um, most of the f future growth for the region will be at 65 mm. plus. So um, look how different it is from the past. So the 1996 to 2011 period had 
uh, three quarters of the growth was at the 0 to 64 year age groups and only a quarter at 65 plus and going forward it just changes so fundamentally. At 65 plus there it's um, about 80, what did we say, 83 or 84 percent at 65 plus. There's the assumed annual net migration uh, for the region, 2,760 over the period um, 2021, 2026 through to 2031. Uh, it drops, it drops away a bit for the next five years and then it slowly comes back up to that point. So I only took that reading just to give you an indication of what the longer term projection assumption was. So what does it mean? You, you've seen this slide before and I mentioned this, what does it mean for things like um, transport? What does it mean for the infrastructure that you have to build? And remember that this is change, it's not your absolute numbers, but it's if you've built your city or your, your town or your infrastructure for your current population, then this is where your growth or decline is going to come, pretty much. Um, I mean, I showed you this slide before, so I'll move on from that. I'll come come back to it for Timaru in a moment. Um, the diversity across the region, you should anticipate that to continue and even get more profound. So some of those areas that are really old are likely to get much older because of the lack of the reproductive potential. I keep wanting to point this. Um, big EST, well obviously these are estimates and um, don't hold me to them. In fact, um, just to follow up on Ross's uh, little commercial break for me before, um, if you are interested in getting any work done when the 2006, uh, 2013 census comes out, it'd um, be good to get hold of me because we get a lot, we're getting a lot of inquiries about doing that. So at the moment we're still working with all these data and we're trying to show rec councils and towns you know, where they've come from. But there's going to be a real um, demand for this sort of work in 2014. And there's very few places, like I know Ross's group here does that sort of work, but there are not a lot of places that actually do it. So um, start thinking about your, your needs as those data come available. Um, Christchurch, Christchurch City, I mentioned before, it's got that youthful population because of the university age population, but you can have that, you know, quite a sizable population there, but it doesn't, doesn't unfold necessarily in terms of births because they University students are supposed to be busy studying, not um, having babies and helping your population grow. <laughs> Timaru's population there, um, the estimate is just <coughs> on 20% over the age of 65, and you can see the comparison with the total New Zealand population in the background there. So that, now this bite here, that, that bite at the total New Zealand level, that's two things, it's the net migration loss of the cohort that was born in the 1970, uh, 1970s that went away and it's the um, falling birth rate at the same time. So it's not just that they didn't just leave, it was also the fact that at the time the birth rate was falling and so there are diminished numbers of them. So we need to make that clear but you can see that for Timaru it's more pronounced. Um, now you've, did I show you this one before? Yes I did. So you see that this is this approach to residual migration methodology and you get this incredible gain there of soaking up, mopping up a lot of the rest of the region's young people. This one for Timaru, I think I showed you that as well. Okay, we'll move on. So the jury is still out obviously but for Christchurch that um, projected growth is likely to be ageing driven. We always tend to think about lots of young people going into Christchurch, but the ageing overwhelms that. So the anticipation is even with a assumed net migration gain of 1,300 a year, every year from 2021, so it dips away first and then it comes back up, there's expected to be declines at these ages and most of that growth being at the older ages. So the projected contribution to growth, again, same sort of picture, 96 through to 2011 shows most of the growth was at 0 to 64. Going forward, it's just a very fraction, very small fraction of that growth. 
in the 0 to 64 year age group. So if you remember that slide that had overall growth and then what's the contribution from 0 to 64 and what's the contribution, sorry, what's the contribution at 65 plus and then 0 to 64, in most cases you get this massive growth at the older ages and zero or even negative at the younger ages. That, that, um, Piper, fair, Natalie, um, I wouldn't have said anybody in this room would have said that that's what's happening in Christchurch. You know, we know Christchurch is growing and we think it's sucking in population from all over the South Island, much the same as Auckland does to the mm. North Island, but that, that's quite astounding to me. That, that well, that's, that's Stats New Zealand's latest projections, um, so has built in what they think is going on there. It's built in standard birth rates and mortal mortality life expectancy rates. But the migration, what happens is you need more and more migrants to offset the, the ageing. So, um, you know, the, there's this, it's like having a bath with the, the migrant. The migration is the taps pouring in, but the plug hole, the plug is open and the older population going out. So that's what's happening. That's the projection there. Um, that's a pretty good point, hmm? that projection. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. They have taken that into account. That's what I'm saying. But the extent to which the baseline population was correct, you know, um, how do we know? Like that, that's first of all, we're working on the 2006 population. It had been moved forward every year using an assumption for births and deaths and migration. Then you get to the to, to the earthquake, and then they've modelled in changed assumptions for the migration and fed them back through into what it means for the birth rates, and that's what it shows, that, oh, that, that picture there. So that's based on adding in births, deaths and migration on the current base population. There is bound to be some correction, but the extent to which it's going to be much different, you know, usually it's, it's a percentage point or two either way, but then we haven't had a situation like Christchurch before, so I put it up there to show you what the current situation, what the current expectation is. Timaru, same, or oh, I mean, sorry, worse. Annual, assumed annual net migration in the Stats New Zealand projections is 100 per year, um, and that's pretty much, I think it was sort of like 80 and drops to 60 and then comes back up to 100, something like that. So overall growth, 2.7% uh, to 2021, 4.2% to 2031, so it's growth, yep, but it's growth primarily at the older ages with these losses here. And this, that more positive migration assumption, you see it feeds in here, that's why these, most of these graphs are showing a little bit in those young adult ages because the migration assumption, the previous projections had a net international migration gain of 10,000 a year they pushed that one up to 12,000 a year. And it's just how they're spread around the country that, that makes it look like that. Is that realistic? Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned before 12,000 was a figure. Is it more likely <coughs> to come into the place like from Maroon? Migration is different to the city. Exactly, mm. exactly. But it has been apportioned in the sort of using historical patterns. Um, and then, you know, a bit of I mean, projections are always like um, sophisticated guesswork, if you like. You know, so we, we, we always talk about projections very carefully. That's the medium case, it says approximately this. If New Zealand did get the annual net migration gain of 12,000 and they moved where they are assumed to move, it will look pretty much like that. But it might be that Timaru gets more, has got more of a base population coming, say, from Christchurch. Small things that happen here um, might encourage, you know, another... What you're up against is, you know, getting another hundred or two young people is difficult when they're flowing the other way. They're the ones that have the babies. So that's, that's the projection. Um, this is where it starts to <coughs> worry somebody like me if I had a house here, and I'm just simply sharing this with you, saying again, it is just a conceptual argument at this stage, but it makes sense. If the people who are in the age at which they 
may want to sell their house. I mean, look, they might sell it from down one street and move to another street when they retire or something like that. But the national study I did of Australia's baby boomers uh, showed that a third of them plan to move on retirement. And I would imagine it's much the same in New Zealand. We're a highly mobile country. In fact, it's much easier. You know, you've got such high stamp, stamp duty in New Zealand, literally means stamp duty. You know, in Australia, it means, you know, you're sort of emptying out your, your um, bank account to pay it. You don't move quite as often. And so I would think that maybe even more New Zealanders would move around. But that's an area that you need to talk to you know, people with housing expertise. But if you've got, that's your 65 plus population potentially selling and the population that is looking first home, second home buyers and whatever is levelled off and diminishing and those two are coming together. It's got to have some effect and that's the sort of work that we need to have done. And that you're, you're the housing affordability person, was that what I picked up before? Okay, okay, so, but you know, this is an area that's not been modelled, nobody takes any notice of it. We're looking overseas and seeing that these that there are uh, huge impacts on communities of people, of, of populations stopping growing, reaching the end of their growth phase, populations declining, houses becoming empty. It's got to have some effect, but what effect? Just before you leave that, does that take into account the declining number of people per household? No, that's just pure population <laughs> numbers. <coughs> It's just pure numbers at those ages. So yeah, it should be done on households, household size. Um, <clears throat> looking across the, the different areas, I just ran these graphs for each of the areas. So uh, Waimakariri, <coughs> um, you know, this is where I say you can almost, you probably some of you know who are in there. <laughs> you can get these little wastes on these, um, populations that you almost identify people in there. That's a real hourglass shape and you know it says that these sort of age structures are not sustainable for very long in terms of natural increase because you can see what's happening here. Um, these are the people having the, having the kids and you can see what's happening. So even while the birth rate's strong, the number of children is coming in. 16% uh, over the age of 65 and 17.4% in Ashburton, which must have some um, young families and children there. I, I don't know anything about your particular areas, but it, you can see the difference with, at the bottom of the age structure there. Um, just go back to that. So here's uh, this, this bite. Normally, if I looked at that at a first cut, I would say net migration loss of young people plus the diminished birth rate or diminishing birth rate when they were born. But when you go to my next slide, it's a little bit of that, but look what happens here. So big gain of um, people in the parental ages, a big gain of kids. And that makes that hourglass shape huge. Now, if you were doing, if you were basing your analysis, well, let me go back a bit, in the past, a lot of councils worked on the size of the population, it, just number, didn't take much account of the age structure. Then you get the age structure and go, oh, that's really interesting, going back to that one. Um, what does that mean for local businesses? Would you start up a um, cappuccino shop for 25 to 29 year olds or would you oh. do something for, you know, that tells you that. But when you go start doing this type of analysis, it says, well, you can start to see what's happening. And we could dig in there a lot more too. We could, if we had the ability to, um, the funds to do that sort of work, you could actually break that up by a lot of things out of the census, you know. So what were the educational qualifications of these people? Um, who came, who left, you know, overseas? Are they from overseas? Are they from somewhere else in New Zealand? There's so many questions that could be answered and they start to help you to understand what the characteristics of your local population are. I was going to tell you a story earlier that when I was in Tasmania, um, my region was called Huonville, and so I did an analysis like this, and it showed them that they had had a net gain of three people over the age of 65. And they said, that's not very exciting. Then they found that they'd actually had 
a net gain of a hundred and uh, sorry that had a an, an, uh, a gain of 103 and a loss of 100 that gave them their net gain of three that started to ring some bells and then they found that the gain had all come from interstate from somewhere else in Australia into that region and the net loss was all intrastate somewhere else in the state and it really starts to tell you why are, why are our local people leaving yeah, presumably yeah. yeah and the, so what is it that, how we're attracting it turned out several dentists who were um, <laughs> commuting still back to Sydney and I don't know there were some lovely stories that came out of it but the point is one number a net gain of three is unremarkable but once you drill down into it and you find how did you get to that number who came who left um, starts to tell you give you some clues about what you might do in terms of attracting population or maybe um, encouraging them to stay and then we broke it down and we found that the 65 plus population it was the older ones who were leaving the region because it was about an hour out of Hobart and they were going more closer into the town for services and it was the younger retirees coming in from the mainland for lifestyle so it was you know really interesting just to do that sort of breakdown but that's um, to me that's quite an astounding picture so that tells you a lot uh, Waimakariri looks like the big winner around here now. Who's, who owns that? Anybody here from? Oh. <laughs> well, yeah. you, you guys. Yeah, the guys from Haranui would be the closest. The okay, way, so. well, so that area. You're ready to take over, Dave? You're ready to take over one? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to share you. <laughs> so, <laughs> but even there, you still see that same shift, you know, from 60, 96 to 2011. Most of the growth was at the 0 to 64, and then you see this massive shift going forward. Um, so, so it's bucking one part of the trend because the projection is quite high for quite high growth and also growth in almost all those age groups. So, more growth at the older ages, but then the base population is smaller. So, that one looks sort of quite healthy. That looks quite healthy as well. Um, be worth buying a house there. <laughs> so Ashburton, um, again, so we're just going over the same type of graphs now and this was just really to show that each, in each case these age structures, while they, they can have different drivers, there's sort of some similar patterns for most of the rest of this region, it tends to be a little bit of a net, oops, that arrow should have been there, so oops, that one should be here, that's loss, that's gain, that's gain and looks like a tiny bit of gain over here and and as I said earlier this um, whole baby boomer retirement thing is only just starting so that's uh, one would expect to see some impact at the older ages in the next census um, that's the projection for the future 7% growth out to 2021 12.6% out to 2031 most at the older ages. Um, there it is in summary. <laughs> you guys are going to be a minority. It's just a two of us. That's cool. If I can just pick up the mic. You want to know why Mac was quite interesting? Because you saw that little bit of growth right at the other side there, the, 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 the retirement end. Yes. We were finding an influx, quite a, a large influx, from retirees from overseas in England. Right. What we have found is there's right. a turnaround since post earthquake, so they're finding it now not a secure place to okay. be and return back home. Right. So Fair I'll be interested to see the next stats coming. Mm. Yes, well, you can see that there. Of course, if I, I could have um, bored you on for longer, <laughs> I could have shown that I have these data for um, 96 to 2001 as well as 2001, 2006, and the picture was generally pretty bleak. bleak in the 96 to 2001 because New Zealand was having a net loss. Um, the picture 2001-2006 looks a lot better. Um, assume net migration up there, so annual 700. Uh, 100 for, oops, sorry. So. Okay, Kaikoura, Horonui, same sort of these youth deficits, but again driven by slightly different things. And these youth, these youth deficits that push up these median ages as much as it is, it looks like some um, increase in those. Does it fit 
does that make you one of the few 25 to 29 year olds left in Haranui, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, and some modest loss at the older stages, so right over there. That no, is out what you were saying. No, you do with health services and hospitalisation and so on, won't it? Well, that's the sort of thing, but if you know, you find you could see a graph like that, and then it's, it should point you in the direction to go and ask those people why. You know, why are people leaving? What is it that we can't have here? Um, so that one jumps around a bit, but definitely significant loss there at those ages, gain there and there and there, and that it, it makes that age structure, that hourglass shape, much more pronounced. Yeah, um, Kaikoura obviously is one of the smallest Jewish local authorities in the district. How is the data for a small authority like that, um, you know, affected in terms of the uh, fish box? Greater margin of error. <laughs> yes, there's just a greater margin of error usually. But I've always found, you know, sometimes we do back projections or we go back further and we project forward. They're remarkably correct. Um, sometimes population, overall population size can be different, but if you just work out something like the proportion of a population over the age of 65, it only alters by a percentage point or so and then um, by age you know it's sort of usually reasonably close but we're just all waiting with you know bated breath for the um, the census. Well I was interested in this course because we always see Jim Hickey on there and he always talks about that Kaikoura coast and he says it so beautifully and I always have this picture of it as a place that must be lovely to, for older people to retire to and when I did the graph I thought oh, it was interesting because there's a wee bit Tiny bit of loss there as well. Only um, three crayfish and a couple of boats, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, <laughs> and again, the same thing the deficit, the loss at the younger ages is accentuated by the gains either side. So it's sort of not all bad, and more of them. Question mark again. So, what the question mark is just, you know, do you know the drivers of your local population? Um, what's actually causing it. But every demographic pyramid you've shown us is remarkably similar. They are. Except they are within an yeah, overall. Yeah, except this cell one is the first one where we've seen a, a lower over 75 That's right. of all the charts. 65 here, plus. Have you know, been overrepresented by the 75 plus, but cell one is the first one that's underrepresented. That's right, 11%. And that's virtually like Auckland, yes. um, except that Auckland has more here. And right. not so much but it there. takes an awful lot of South Island TAs to make up for an Auckland. Yes. In fact, it takes all of them. Yes. And the point about that, the fact that it is so similar, is it comes back to the point that I made earlier. It's about there's this diminishing pool of young potential people to come to your area. So if you, where are they going to come from locally? They're not actually there anywhere, unless you can track them back out of. Christchurch perhaps and you know as somebody we were talking just before lunch um, you know education is the best thing to get rid of your population that you can do you know you educate your young people and they leave you educate women and they don't have children so you know <laughs> so, so you're recommending barefoot <laughs> 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 and pregnant <laughs> no <laughs> um, I thought this one was pretty pretty amazing actually for Selwyn and there you see that huge gain of young families and kids. So it says something maybe about affordability, maybe about schools, I don't know. Again, you, you are the people that can put the flesh on the bones, but when I look at the patterns they're just fascinating because you've not, not really got a major net migration loss at that young adult ages either, that's actually one of the smallest. Is it close enough to Christchurch to drive for you? Yeah. yeah, okay. And, and they're, they're also basically got all that growth around the edges of Christchurch and Ralston right. and Lincoln, but yeah. uh, that's driving yeah. that, so yeah. So we can be, it is a different chat for the others, and we've been working on ANUs for anti management plans for someone that did have different issues because of it, and projecting those forward, which is uh, quite an interesting um, exercise. So buying a house and selling this for a little bit is a safe bet. Yeah. Um, just something I've been meaning to point out. This this gap that you see in each of these graphs, that's population ageing. So there were at 50 to 54, 
there were that many in um, 19, in 2001. So we survived them at the going uh, death rates, if you like, which meant that a few dropped off. That's how many you expected. Um, and that's uh, so much bigger than the population of that age that was there before. So you see what you're getting is a cohort gain. So sometimes people go, oh, we're getting this huge increase in people 55 to 59 or something like that, and they're all moving in here. They're not. That's why you need to do this. This is controlled for cohort size. Uh, yep, okay, buying houses there. Um, Mackenzie, similar pattern again. Uh, quite noticeable net migration loss at those older ages over there. That's where you're getting them. Yeah. They're all coming in. <laughs> And again, so again, to make that point again, the, these age structures are remarkably similar. Um, is, is this Waitaki? Is that? <laughs> that's Waitaki, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the same picture again, and the same picture again, and I think that's about where I was going, just to give you the idea. So the point about it all is, um, you know, population projections, they, they're very useful. Um, they tell you if births do this, deaths do that, and migration does that, that is what your population will look like on the basis of the population by age and sex that we had there to start with. You can make interventions that can change those outcomes, but not by much. So you've got to be, you use the projections. I've only used the medium case here today, but usually I also present with showing you what the high and the medium and the low looks like. I did have it right at the start on the first slide, one of the first slides, it said that the Canterbury region will grow. The high was quite high, medium, and the low was pretty much flat. Um, but you should always think about projections in terms of the parameters within which a change might occur. So look at the high and look at the low. But this, when you're presenting, <laughs> you get too tongue-tied trying to do it all. So that's, that's the overall picture. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things that we've touched on, like um, tight labour markets, you can see that and how widespread that is going to be. If that's the baseline population you've got now, we go forward five years, and that those negative entry-exit ratios are unfolding across the rest of the country, so people are competing for them. But there's a lot of potentially good things, and I'll just go back to that slide that Ross had up there earlier, where it showed that projected um, reduction in... So social non non, super, non superannuation, social welfare, and so on. Um, demographers in, across Europe they project that population aging could just about solve um, unemployment. You know, obviously you're always going to have some structural unemployment from different shocks that happen and so on. But generally, people are going to be in such short supply and such great demand that you sort of go back to the, some of the situations that we had, like in the, they said in New Zealand in the 1950s that um, New Zealand had 12 unemployed people and the government knew them by name. So, <laughs> you know, we could hope to see situations like that again and that would be a really good thing coming out of population ageing. So that's, that was the presentation for this afternoon was really just to give you that local flavour on it because I wasn't sure exactly what um, you would want to know and... And every time I hazard a guest, like getting into things like housing markets or what it's going to do for things, I, I get my fingers burned. So I'd be keen to hear from you what you think those trends might mean for some of you and some of the things that you do. Just, just before we do that, Natalie, you sent me a paper that you've done some work for East Ends District and Hawke's Bay Region, I think, where you've been looking at in a lot more detail. Oh, um, yes. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure, yeah. Um, look, I, I actually meant to bring one. Um, we've done some sociodemographic profiles taking all of these type of data and means that um, we've, we've covered the population coming right through from about 1980 in each area. Now, boundary changes and all that all taken into account, so we've break the graphs at the correct places and so on to show you that there have been these changes. Um, look at how the age structures changed, ethnicity, um, half a dozen major industries, you know, really a very comprehensive profile. And uh, they, they are, you know, really very useful, but 
like now we're starting to get to that point where we want to check our assumptions and you know what we've done with them. Um, most of the graphs that you've seen here are graphs that I've used in those profiles, so we're really happy to do them for people. Um, I was going to say though, they are. So it went out of my head. Oh yeah, now the good thing about it is that often people go and get um, demographic data done, um, like just, you know, from different sources. This means that you can call up um, Northland or Gore or somewhere like that, and you know, what do you look like on page 32 or something like that, you know, it's a, a common platform across the whole country, because I've created all these databases where it's just a matter of clicking the drop down box and finding the region and everything updates for that region. So they are very useful if your people aren't convinced that this is happening. The best thing is to show them how it's been unfolding and you see that incremental, systematic unfolding of the increase in 65 plus, the diminishing of the entry exit cohort and so on. Look, I just, I did actually run off a, a table I need to hand these out. Oh here, yeah, I'll just start here. This has um, your, relates to those pie graphs that I had there. It shows you the change in those two very broad age groups, 0 to 64 and 65 plus, for each of the TAs, both for the 96 to 2011 and 2011 to um, 2031 projected period. And you'll see when you get them some really huge um, numbers at the bottom there, like for example between 2011 and 2031, Timaru's expected to grow by about 4.3%, we saw that before, um, to get 200% decline at 0 to 64 and 300% growth at 65 plus. So that's why those numbers look so big, but it, that's what delivers you the 4.3%. The so I thought that might be useful. Yeah, and I'd just like to first cab off the ring, right, is, is to talk a little bit about that because I think of all the charts you had up, Timur is probably typical of the central South Island over here, other than so on. It's reasonably sort of in the average. And I'd like to talk about what that means, especially, um, and if you can find the Timur one, I reckon it'd be great, in terms of this age weighted service expectation. Because whilst we've got the, the population growth or, or decline in various age brackets, then, then converting that into a growth model in terms of consumption of services mm. and then what that means in terms of, of what is the type of service. For example, does those age uh, shifts and the demographic shift, what does that mean for our transport services? Yes. And more particularly, what type of transport services? And what time of day do they use And them? what time of day and, and you know, passenger transport. Mm. We do have a bus <laughs> service in Timaru. Yes. What does that mean for those people? And, and do they actually have money and they don't actually want to, and they have cars, therefore do they want to travel on the buses? Mm. And do they want to travel at weekends? And it really is not easy. No. I know, and there's lots of models. It again goes back to that point about revisiting some of the models and their basic principles, because uh, I know in, in uh, Tasmania, the Metro provided a bus stop for every 500 people. And I said, well, is that 500 old or young people? Yeah. I mean, it makes a big difference, you know. And, or 500 people with cars or without cars, you know, there's obviously all that sort of thing you can do. But doing those, so if you have age-specific usage data, doesn't matter whether it's broad age groups or narrow age groups. Actually, I did some stuff with transport data, so I know that that's available. Um, you can project it forward. Mm. Quite, a, it's, it's intuitively, I imagine you would all know what I'm talking about. You take the age-specific usage rates, hold them constant, and say, if, if the age-specific usage rates don't change, what does the changing age structure do to it? And it usually blows you away. If you do a crude projection, you'll get, say, a growth in demand of X, and you do an age-weighted projection. If it's something that older people do, you're going to get a much faster, much bigger increase. Especially with... Yeah, yes, with that, um, the, the movement into that older age bracket. And of course, the other, the other one that's, that's interesting with that is the modal shift. You know, do we have more people going to be using bicycles or not? Yes. Or, or moving from bikes to cars yeah. to buses or, or back again. And that really is going to get <coughs> hard to predict. 
Peter and I were um, talking over lunch, and he put it up with a smiling face on the paper, on the front page of the paper, if he upsets too many people at the moment. Um, <laughs> we were actually talking about the land use planning issue, and it's an infrastructure planning and a land use planning issue, because you know you get the retired farmers, for example, shift off a few hundred acres into town, and the smallest they're going to have is a quarter of an acre, because they want that space around them. But if you continue building your towns around that, that style of land use, you're actually not efficiently able to provide those services. And we're talking about this age-weighted service expectations. You know, how can you do this in an efficient way? And we have a bit that might upset people. Is we, do we actually need to be talking more realistically about medium density housing? Because you know, urban sport isn't a cost-effective way to continue to provide these services. And so I think there's actually two issues that we need to think about with this. When we do have an understanding of what is the future look like, and when we take this combination of data together, and then look, well, how are we going to develop the land effectively? How are we going to house these people? And then what infrastructure is needed to support that in a sustainable manner? I think that's really worth looking into and um, talking about. Because so, I think that's the combination of the, plan of the land use planners and the infrastructure planners you know, working together quite effectively. There's something else you could perhaps target on there is, is, is disconnectivity with the state highways running through the middle of many of these townships. Mm -hmm. With an ageing population, it's becoming quite difficult. So you're having to almost mirror image uh, your development across State Highway. Mm -hmm. I think that's the term that's I've heard called before as well, social segments. Where you chop a community in half with yep. State Highway. Yep. I think Christchurch is experiencing even that at the moment. Well, Kapiti's got a huge problem with mm -hmm. that. It's through Smiths and Gullies. It actually completely mucks up now they've got the routes sorted out. All their, all their township connectivity um, planning that they've done. Um, the thumping grates four or six lane high running right through the guts of your uh, district or white meadows the same. Um, yeah, I heard the same thing discussed particularly in regard to Auckland. If you've got a school catchment like this and you're going to put a multi-lane highway through the middle of it, what happens over here? This school's too small and this um, and these people aren't being um, sufficiently served. So just coming back to your point Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, do you, do you have some gems of some ideas as, or, or genesis of some ideas as to how you would start working on progressing that thinking around effectively age-weighted service delivery model or expectation models and then how that translates into hard infrastructure mm. and, and planning? Maybe, maybe, well, I'm sorry, Andrew Dixon might, might, might speak, but it's, it's really... <laughs> no really, pressure, Andrew. No, no it's, <laughs> it's, it's really <laughs> difficult having the conversation, right? trying to start the conversation. Because the, the first thing that is easy to do is to put on a piece of paper the statistics proposed uh, projected growth rate. You know, low, which is negative, medium, which is negative, and high, which is flat. And, you know, and, and some people think, well, that's growth. Well, it's not growth, that's population numbers. And that's something different. Uh, and then trying to get a handle on what that is and then converting that into what it means for our infrastructure just, just trying to have the conversation with people is, is difficult, but it's just almost too hard because it, it's not here and now. You know, it's, it's a generation. Well, actually, I'm thinking of your wonderful pool out there. If you were to do a, get a couple of high school kids and do a survey of people there and try and get their age group, and then you, you get an idea of your age-specific usage, actually looking out there, I could just about see it. Mm. <laughs> um, but you got a, you had those schools but it going through there. The day, you know, we're yeah. open from 5.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. and it changes every hour throughout the day, it's different. And you could have segments of the day and that sort of thing, but then you project it forward and, and then you could uh, work at, out the revenue from that and that would be one way you could show that giving pensioners free access is actually not going to work not long term. No. Exactly. But, but, you know, it's... It's still that thing about not having sticks, about having needing for carrot, needing to have carrots, and helping people to understand that if they want these things, they have to contribute, and they've got to move away from that idea of ever upward growth. A lot of people I find think that the growth will come back. Look, I've spoken with so many town councils and mayors and so on throughout Australia, and they say, "When will the growth come back?" And you say, oh, it won't, it's gone because we know why you got the growth and we know that the growth has now ended um, and this is the way it's going to be in the future. People tend to, tend to think everything is cyclical, that it, it's just a cycle that we're going through. But you know, once they start to understand what constitutes population, births, deaths and migration, 
you can see that you can't squeeze any more growth out of what there is. The, the biggest problem is that people see growth linked to economic growth. Yes, and well, that's the right. Economic goes through this boom and bust cycle, and they believe that population, population follows. Is going to do the same. Yeah. That's right. And then somebody always says, "Well, you didn't. You demographers didn't pick the baby boom. Demographers didn't pick the baby boom, but it was." the post-war economic boom, actually, that really delivered the babies, you know. Um, there were a number of reasons for it. New Zealand and Australia and Canada, United mm. States, this particular stage of development they were at, the very low levels of female education, higher education and labour force participation, cultural factors, social factors that kept women out of the workforce and, and throughout uh, I'm, I'm not sure the extent to which it happened in New Zealand, but Australia and Canada, um, when the um, forces came home, all the female school teachers and uh, many other women who were working were, um, had lost their jobs because the jobs had to go back to the men. So they went home and had babies. <laughs> you know, there's so many explanations for the baby boom, which is why we can't ever expect to get another one. There was an extremely high social welfare Yes. And and a lot of the all those European migrants coming into New Zealand and Australia, you know, wanted to come here and have a baby, have a set, make a family in their new country. It, you, once you decompose the baby boom, there's not really any mystery about it. But it tells us why we can't expect another one. Actually, the um, graph that you had of summary was the age shifting going through in the, the black circle. Um, the, the thing that I and I, the thing I found really interesting about that is I as I sit somewhere in, in this range here we won't define exactly where. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, we had a we had a gutting of you know when in the 80s uh, when the government departments um, dropped out of out of the provincial towns of your professionals in that in that age range mm. and, and I was actually really fascinated to see how much that's dropping because these I'm thinking well hardly half the mates are going to leave Timaru in that range but. But also, you know, these, these proposals are kicking around at the moment of consolidation of local government and transport and water and all that sort of thing. That, if those go ahead, they would actually accelerate those sorts of trends because the management, local management of things in hospitals and all those sorts of things would then trend to, to Christchurch and, and Canterbury space. And, um, so is that showing up in a, other than here in Tomorrow or is it uh, in terms of... Is that it's really trending? The that question, picture. Ross, is really is, is that happening, in, is that typical of provincial New Zealand? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. And, it's, and, and you just mentioned the government administration jobs, um, you know, in t territorial authorities that lost government jobs. Um, uh, Waitomo is a classic, looks just like that. Um, so you see it, you do see it, but I don't know what <coughs> sits behind so you can see the overall assume net migration is a hundred net gain. Obviously there's losses and there's a hundred more people uh, projected to come in than leave. But I don't know on what basis Stats New Zealand have made that call because usually they take into account historical factors. So if that historical factor was the shifting of government jobs somewhere to Wellington or to Christchurch, then it may not be repeated to the same extent. Like they don't just follow things slavishly, they, you know, it's been five years, or well, two years at least, working on these things. Um, yeah. But I, I... That it, just seems quite high, I mean like 40% of people in, you know, 35, 40% in that sort of range. Mm. That's a lot of people. What, the other question I have with that is what, what was the drought? Where you actually had the impact, a severe impact on farming and you literally had people moving off the land into, you know, families moving into jobs in town because they were no, no longer uh, the farm was involved. When was that last? Uh, when we talk about? Yeah. Well, there was a serious drought in '88. Yeah. 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 But yeah, on the four as well. Yeah. Mm. Some, some of those factors I mentioned, if they occur at similar time, they really, you know, build on each other. Mm. Accentuate that. Um, I was interested in terms of the farm provincial centres in comparison. You go a bit to Barnesville. I was interested last week. You know, there I'm driving through, thinking, goodness me, this town's humming. Um, and I was on the plane flying up and I was surrounded by all of these guys from Power Farming. And they were all going there because that's where the head office is. And they had a training session. And just the amount of growth in that commercial sector in Morrinsville, I noticed for the previous time I was there. 
and I thought it's it's interesting the impact that a um, a business like that can have in a mm. provincial area is quite significant. Whereas in a large urban area, it's a blip. Yes. Uh, and I think that's one of the things why I wrote down the impact of centralisation on here is particularly in, in provincial New Zealand that um, you know, so few of those businesses and the same again with um, public entities, mm. whether they exist or not in that location, has a huge impact. Grant, That's do you right. mean centralisation as in Wellington or centralisation mm. as in regionalisation? Um, yeah, probably more regionalisation. With amalgamation, we could Palmerston get that North's mini centralisation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Palmerston also an interesting one as well because of the number of companies that have decided yeah. they're going to put the head office somewhere like Palmerston North and that's, um, yeah, that creates a different, different situation. And you do see that impact and mm. as soon as you see one withdrawn, you see the impact there as well. Mm. But you know, mostly in most of the territorial authorities, we'd be talking a loss of 60 jobs or 60, yeah, 60 jobs. But 60 jobs can affect, you know, 220 people. Say, you know, if you've got a partner, a couple of kids. If you look at that middle range there, that 35 to you know, 59, that is your working age. You've got to have the jobs if you're going to have the people there. Mm. You'd be potentially in that group as well. I am, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Is this a global phenomenon? Obviously some countries will still be have a very young demographic profile. Developing countries do. Because yeah. mm. I know currently we import labour, you know, the temporary jury farms with people yes. from Chile, yeah. Mm. And in Central Otago they've got um labour coming in from Vanuatu. That's right. Yeah. That's what I said before. Mm. Are they gonna buy the farms? Mm. No. no. No, so you can keep bringing them in, but that, what I meant to say when I was presenting with that uh, industrial stuff, you might have got, it, got the message with those arrows that I had going across, but it just shows how those industries have aged dramatically just over a 10 year period. Well, we're now um, seven years on from the last one, so we expect those bars to be up another one. That means those, those farming aid structures are at such a point where most of these people will be looking to, if not sell, to you know, um, pass those farms on down to their families or whatever, the, the succession planning thing. But I know a lot of farmers that want to actually sell their farms and they're thinking the, the demand isn't there because the, um, you know, the economy is bad or whatever. But actually, look at the industry, look at the shape of the industry because all of this technology over these last 10, 20 years has meant you take fewer and fewer and fewer young people and then you start importing them because you can't get enough local young people. The question is, who is going to buy them? Because I only showed you grain, sheep and beef. There's dairy, um, there's horticulture, um, you know, all the other types of farming and they all have age structures that look like that. Yes, they have. They are and, and I understand, you know, that um, I understand where the Chinese buyers and so on have come in from, but it's like, this is going to fundamentally change the face of New Zealand, New Zealand's own self-image of itself as a farming family nation. Um, if we look at those age structures and take them 10 years on, who will be there? Uh, these guys, farmers hang on because that counts. Those, age, those mm -hmm. industrial data are the employed population or the population that identifies itself as being employed, working in those things. Well, they hang on till the end, most of them, but we can't prevent the process. <laughs> so they will. Um, and, and I've been watching those, those data, same in Australia, those age structures going back to about the 80s. They were youthful. Look, I was a farmer, you know, and so we bought our first farm in um, 1971. And every farmer that I knew were, was about, you know, in their 20s like us. And now, <laughs> I'm going to their funerals, things like that. <laughs> so, you know, farmers age and we haven't been taking in young people to replace them. But it's, it's across all the industries, except retail, hospitality. Um, I just want to general service quick for the issue, because you mentioned the barbecue example was a very good one before. The community want one thing and sooner or later it grows into the next thing and something else you've got to maintain and, and all the rest. Um, I'm, I'm still keen to talk about this land use planning and infrastructure planning issue, but given the combination of people 
go around the world. Uh, there was one particular which I was keen to pick up there, probably the Sutra Tiger, and the Kinsey in particular. We talk about normal resident population. And yes. you've got another circumstance to deal with, of course, is you've got a lot of visitors and a lot of holiday makers. So I think you've actually got three, in a way, three groups that, um, that may be compounding. And so I'm just interested, how, how, how does that balance work for, in your case, Brady? Well, it, it makes it quite difficult because you've got, we, we've got about 46% absentee landowners. So, you know, you've got all this infrastructure to, to, to provide for those. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this, this um, Christmas holiday, Easter, those sort of things, huge peaks. And then like we've got on at the moment with the rowing, and whilst nobody actually does the numbers, but you know, you, you, hear, you hear stories of, of six to 10,000 influx coming into to one community. So you know, the, the peaks that you've got to provide for those numbers sort of outweigh what we're talking about here with the normal resident population. And but it's a normal, normal resident population that's paying for it. Yes. Yeah, well, that's a normal resident population in terms of that Twizel community of? Of 1,012, I think it was, in the last census or something like that. Yeah. And and you know the the the, the interesting thing we were just talking about at, at lunchtime, we had um, Mount Cook Salmon his um, industry started in, in Twizel, really keen, wanted to wanted to, to grow that area. They have sucked the market pull up to that extent that when they wanted to, to do their own salmon processing plant, they wanted to put it back in Twizel or somewhere around that area. To, to boost the whole economy, and they did a demographic study and said, hey, we can't build it here, because we will not get workers, because the workers that we're going to have, we can't pay them enough for them to be able to buy a property to come into the community to then support it. So Timaru is the winner of that, so, and they're building their, their plant down here, because they, they know that they've got a, a sufficient market pool, you know, workforce to drag from to make it happen. That's where you're really caught, isn't it? Because if you work, had been able to put it where you wanted, it might have attracted Would have been like workers. Yeah, that's right, exactly right. Russell, and in the central, you've got similar issues, but you've also, uh, I think you've also got the issue with the labour pool with uh, Queenstown. You know, I think my experience with that, you know, my father's friends with the guy that has that started off the commute of us from Cromwell to Queenstown, because people couldn't afford to live in Queenstown, so they lived in Cromwell. He started off with a minibus, and as I understand, he now runs two full-size buses on shift because there are so many people now who actually go from Central Otago District into Queensland Lakes District to work. So again, you've got those patterns within it that really yeah. complicate the picture to another level. Right? Yes, that's that's right. They do, and of course, these boundaries are, you know, boundaries that have been there for a long time. Uh, some of my colleagues, of course, they do a different type of boundary. They use um, labour market areas actual labour market areas uh, which make more sense when we're talking about that than a TA boundary which has just been a line historically drawn and doesn't always match people's commuting habits or where they, you know, as somebody said over here, they drive across the, you said, you know, they right on the outside, they can just drive next door. So they get counted in one TA and work in another. The other one that, that's changed quite significantly is dairy farms particularly with the farm workers, you know, and, and that whole Gypsy Day thing on, you know, July the 1st, when, they, when they're all, and, and they and they just, you talk about being mobile, that's one group of, of the community that's very, very mobile, and they pick themselves up and they move vast distances all around the country. And so do white people go? And, and, and they may be, they may have a, um, a number of children in a school, and then partway through the year, they're gone, and it's that person's been replaced by a single person, so there's no children that have come back in to, you know, so mm -hmm. it has a big, a big impact on, on the schools, schools viability, and all the other things that hang off it. And their bus routes, and setting up nice little bus shelters for these kids, and suddenly they're gone. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult to, yeah. to plan around those sort of things. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, you raise the issue, Grant, of the, the sort of peak population versus um, usually less than the population, I don't know how councils plan for that. I think what we've heard today about you know, numerical ageing and structural ageing, it's actually going to widen that, that gap. Now, usually resident populations in the long run will probably get smaller, and potentially the, the gap between that and peak demand is going to go larger. Mm. So the ability of that um, 
the usual resident population to fund the total cost of that service. You're just going to put pressure on funding mechanisms. And That's right. So it's, it's a double whammy, in effect, for some reason. Mm -hmm. The other one that, that we noticed in, in the little community of Kimble where I live, which is you know, only 24, 25 people, but we, we're finding that as the houses, as people retire and you know, move somewhere else, invariably that house is bought as a holiday home. So the people that are left there are getting more and more isolated, and therefore you, the older people that are in those communities don't have somebody looking after them. Mm. So then, you know, you'll have a have a, an emergency event, or or they'll just injure themselves. They don't have any neighbours, so and get all these sort of things that, that come into it as well. And those are the things that you can actually plan for because you can know with absolute certainty that a yep. uh, large proportion of your your, num your older numbers are going to grow, and that they tend to age in place. They like it, and there's a government policy which encourages it as well. But yep. it's not the best thing, you know. What we find is for a lot of those older people. And I've got colleagues who work on that. Um, you know, sometimes the only person they ever speak to is, you know, somebody who happens to drop something next door or whatever. They they don't have that support. So those are areas that we will have to look at supporting in the future. There's um, a whole unpaid carer issue involved in that as well. well those of us in local government see it most, you know, quite frequently during the week, our working week, will there be an old person ring up with a complaint? Or an issue, but it's more about a, a contact with somebody to have a conversation. So you're sort of like a social worker now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we have been for years. Okay, we'll <laughs> <laughs> we don't, you know, you're right. Uh, can I just pick up on the point that Richard made um, around the um, this gap between the peak and the new resident and the, and the affordability and sustainability of funding? Because because what that hints at is that our current funding models are going to be quite inadequate going forward. Mm -hmm. They'll already be models, shall we say. Mm. Um, and that debate really hasn't even started around the place, I don't think, so... Well, that, that's what I referred to, um, the day-tripper population disability factor that Australian local governments can appeal on. Yes. Yeah. And, and so everybody takes a role in sharing the cost of that because that council has to provide those services and everybody else uses them, um, so it spreads the load. Yeah. But you're but you're hundred percent right. That debate needs to be had because it's not only for that, that area, but it's also that tourism dollar that, that we all have to provide for that the, the tourism market that comes in that the ratepayers pay for that is debatable for how much actual real benefit we actually get for it. And you know, central government does need to look at other ways to support those those local authorities that actually got a, a big strain on those sort of resources. Mm. But South and District Council just did that recently with the um, visitor levy on Stuart Island for yeah. the whole purpose. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they recognise that dis um, discrepancy sitting in there. Yep. And uh, yeah, okay. obviously looking at something again similar for Milford, the whole area of the, the stresses of the going the infrastructure through that. Yeah. So there are, you know, I think the debate has already started. There's models to work on, aren't yeah. there? Mm -hmm. It has about to go through legislation is another point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that just makes it very difficult. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about council infrastructure, but just looking at that huge growth in the aged area, there's going to be a stress on the health services as well. And one thing I can see is we probably need to start aligning ourselves a little bit, or at least talking to health more, because <coughs> it's a double-edged sword. If, if the health services start to get scaled back, then our predicted growth in older people may actually decline, because they always want to be next to good health services. And the fact that Timaru has got a base hospital is, is a huge advantage. But if we lose that base hospital status, mm. we, we could actually be facing um, you know, decline even in those higher ages. That's right, the, the older population tends to start moving back in their late 70s or you know we sort of talk about it now as being in their 80s where it used to be in the 70s um, because the younger old population are relatively healthy. There's that whole you know compression of mortality thing that says we keep people alive uh, for longer, we're keeping them alive healthier but the last so many years are sicker and they need to be closer to services. 
But health boards are pretty aware of that sort of thing. We do quite a bit of work with them. It was actually um, Nelson, or oh, Marlborough District Health Board that was part of the uh, body that had some work done. They were keen to know what was going to be happening there. some of their issues they face and them understanding some we face. And the, some of the issues they face, of course, go back to those age structures too, the, the actual health services, you know, who is there to deliver these services. And following on from that, is seven years ago there was a big um, schools redraw and review in this area and resulted in Pleasant Point High School um, disappearing amongst a whole lot of other changes. And I guess we, we're aware of what's happening in Christchurch at the moment, which, which is not all quake related. I mean, there's a whole lot more in it than just earthquake stuff. Mm. Are, the, are the education people really looking at this seriously? Because there's, there's strong implications here for education, isn't there? Well, I mentioned that earlier. I don't... My take on it is that they're not. Um, yeah. You know, I could name a few people who know what's going on and they say that those data are not part of the... Um, of the the equation, no. Some political things going on. Actually, but um, I was in the South and on the same sort of review occurred, and then looking at Timaru in both cases, my memory's right, the local authority actually funded a review of the demographic data that was being used by the ministry, and in both cases it was found that their, but the data they were using and projecting forward was too short. So if you had a blip going down in Timaru, that was the forecast that was used to identify the school needs in the future. And mm. that was what was found when the councils jointly in the South and funded it and supported a, uh, a review. So that does raise an interesting it's, it's going to be, it's critical as, as you get these waves in the population, the birth cohort follows, you know, as I've been saying, you, the size of your birth cohort is the combination of the birth rate per woman and the number of birth women birth. there. Yeah. So if you have a dip and then you happen to have a high a larger cohort stay, move into that reproductive age group, then they can generate a baby, a little baby boomlet, which is really what we've had, at the one that started around 2002. There's, there's about five, six years worth of births, quite a few more births, about 10,000 more births than New Zealand anticipated, um, sort of working their way through the system. And they're just about three years into school at the moment, into primary school, but they will arrive at intermediate age and then they will arrive at high school and they will arrive at university. And was that was that blip, as you've called it, nationwide? Was it across the board yes. or it was? Yes. Yeah. But you can see in some areas there, some of your areas you haven't got it. If, if you look at um, Manukau and you know those sort of areas, they've got a little skirt on the bottom of those age structures. They've got a large proportion of those births have occurred in those areas. Um, some areas here, there's not a lot of evidence of it, but there were a couple, I'm um, trying to remember which TAs it was, but there were a couple there that had quite uh, little skirts on the bottom of them. So you will have that wave goes through. So, picking, um, picking up on this, uh, there's a couple of terms that we're, that I think going forward as local authorities in particular, we really have come out of this, I think that's the, this age-weighted service expectation is actually thinking more about what services do we need to provide to that community and thinking about them separately and I think there's a number of issues here and looking at the service areas that people are involved in, do you think that um, the road and water community facilities, you know, the likes of this facility is a good example and as I mentioned the, the playgrounds and community parks issue before, you know, are people thinking about this stuff and how do they think that as they move forward to the next long-term plan that, um, that they'll do things differently? Well, 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 well there's one thing to and that's you know, the provision of social housing. I mean, it used to be called pensioner units, it used to be called mm. elderly persons housing, now it's social housing. And, you know, and the number of units and, and who are they for is certainly coming under scrutiny. And then following on from that, of course, is how much do these people pay in rent? And do they get um, housing supplements and all sorts of things that I don't understand? And it really is some uh, um, crystal ball gazing that needs to go into that because it's, it's hard to know um, what people's requirements are. You can project the, the numbers of people probably that are in that are in the 
in the um, category that might need support, but then what sort of support do they need mm. and when is, is rather difficult. Why, mm. how much, and how much can they pay? The, the comment was made before, so why take it a wee bit further than this continuum um, in terms of the age structure? So I mean, there's probably a wee bit of difference you know, with, with the issues that white is facing now and how they're dealing with these. Well, well, it's, um, Tony, we've done to, to, um, to this stage has basically been on uh, zero growth, pretty much all stack mining. So, um, but it's, it's numbers. But yeah, it's I know numbers, really, it's numbers. numbers. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't done yeah. interrogation of it. But then you've you been within your growth models, you've broken that down to actually look at the communities as well to see, no. you know, <coughs> as opposed to looking at the district as a whole. I know you've looked at the, the yeah, communities it's, it's more on numbers, so Sorry? It's more on numbers mm. um, rather than just looking at graphics. Well, you do. You have natural decline yeah. there, and um, although it sort of wavers around a bit, but mostly when regions go into natural decline, they do waver around for about ten years. They so maybe above and below, um, and that means that net migration loss and natural decline puts you puts that TA that unique among New Zealand TAs at the moment as in that next stage. So we have to accept with that reality, and we have to where. Um, probably limit that to economic growth using a sort of three percent growth thing, and probably inadvertently link those two together. Uh, and also, we had uh, potentially some industries coming to town as well. So we've we've sort of kept on that that slightly positive side um, quite a long way at this stage. So that's what the plan is based on. So it's basically very much maintaining what we've got. Yes. And we haven't put any strategies in place to decline those services, although we've we are talking about what we might have to do at some stage in some areas. So it's around the prioritisation on, you know, and um, well, it's it's level of service reality. differentiation. Well, it's first mm -hmm. accepting reality, mm -hmm. and then um, once we've got a handle on that, then that's what we're doing. Now, I was talking at lunchtime about the ABC of, of ageing, and I said, in the D stands for denial. That's right. It's the people that are around. Like the science of grief, really, isn't it? Yeah. Grant, we've got yeah. um, fairly just finished an upgrade to its medical facility to suit the increased uh, ageing population, and there is significant pressure coming on. And in fact, a group, a trust already established in Twizel, to rebuild a facility in in Twizel specifically to deal with the ageing population with a view to be able to, to bring in more specialists and, and all of that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So that's taking it going from a community medical facility, recognising that the population is ageing and then that we need to do something more at, because it's, well, Twizel to Timaru, it's, you know, it's a three hour journey, you know, and, and there's, we've had to put on um, buses, community cars, all those sorts of things to deal with to actually get those that ageing group down here to Timaru to the medical facility. So, it, and and of course, there's who's going to fund that? Where's it coming from? And they're coming to the local authorities, and they're going to all the other. You, you know, we talk about community funding stuff. There's a lot of external community funding being being chased into there, and all because of that that graph doing that that big lump at the end. That's right. And something else that's that's a bit sobering. It gets more and more do gloom and doom, doesn't it? But um, the current elderly are the parents of the baby boom as well. Yeah. And you have to realise that on average they've got, most of them had kids, and nearly all of them have got a kid to call on. A few of them are overseas, but most of them have got them. As we go forward, as that birth rate started to drop, future, the next cohorts that you're going to see there, have fewer kids available to be there to help transport older people around. Now, one thing that... Um, I've seen popping up, and I actually thought I saw something on it in New Zealand recently, but I can't remember exactly where, is the concept of the, uh, it's like a motel situation for people leaving hospital, but they're not well enough to go home, yeah. and family come and stay with them. Um, it was given a name, it was sort of like hospital or something like that. Yeah. Um, so that, because a lot of old people, when they come out of hospital, they're going home to empty houses, because mm -hmm. their partners died or you know they're by themselves so these are some areas that have got to be looked at too but it's probably more an issue for health boards to deal with I would imagine that's health board funding. So just think so in terms of age group I mean you've still got a hospital obviously but you know, I know some of it's 
damage. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've terribly lost the last time I went there. But um, how's that playing out for the financial burden in terms of... Because you, you're also so much closer to Christchurch. Well, for health I think that, um, to be honest with you, I don't know terribly much about it, but I, think, I believe that they're providing core services still yeah. at the hospital. Um, and yeah, and, and, and it is only an hour, 50 minutes, whatever it is, to Christchurch. So Ash Burden, I think, almost benefits in some ways. Is it's almost a community suburb now. There certainly are people that can move to Christchurch from, from Ash Burden. Mm -hmm. um, so we probably have a bit of a benefit in that, we gain some of that benefit. But certainly, in a wider scale of things, you know, we've, we've had a number of inquiries about uh, targeted health care. For older people, the number of retirement villages and things that are going up is, you know, it's, it's significant. Or we just inquiries about them. You know. I'd be interested in going back to the uh, Ashburn uh, at this moment because you are in a slightly different position. And you're you're on you're right on the edge, really. Mm -hmm. You're beyond just being handy enough for Wall Wallston and um, yeah, you know, ring your type um, mm -hmm. type situation. So you're probably on the transition a little That's what's happened. That's the projection. That's remarkably similar to Tomorrow, isn't it? This is mm. not yeah. as accentuated. Within, with a few different perturbations, they all look the same. Mm. And they do for the 600 odd local governments in Australia as well. That's the big message is that that's where the, the growth is overwhelmingly there. So you know, New Zealand says we're going to get to, we're 4.4 million, we're going to get to X. What did I say before? Two thirds of the growth for total New Zealand is at 65 plus, and then once you get down to your regions, in many cases, as you'll see on that handout, it's all at 65 plus. So the, p the pattern is the same, yeah. And and you know, in some ways, the, the, the minor differences um, are probably not worth focusing in on too much because they could be just anomalies of the data because of the whether the base was correct or the projection this far out is is correct as um, of concern but the overall picture that you should take away is just that overall growth at the top and virtually no growth down there. Mm. One of the things that's amused me in the last half hour, um, Grant, is that within six months of the government um, trying to strike out integrated community outcomes out of the purpose of local government, here we are sitting here as a group of professionals saying, well, we should probably start coordinating a bit better with health and with education and, <laughs> and um, with local service provision and just making sure we get it right for our districts so that we've got the services there that we need to uh, to meet, you know, to keep our populations and our economies going. And it's like, hmm, and, what's that? and what, what are we supposed to be doing now according to the government? So it's, uh, it's just mildly yeah. amusing, shall we say. <laughs> I see that's one of the biggest faults of the government is that they work in silos far too much, you know, we see it. Mm. Yeah, you know, just one ministry doesn't talk to another ministry. Yeah. And they're all making decisions that actually impact each other, but just there's no communication. Yeah. What, I, what, what I'm getting from uh, hearing you talk about it as well is that it's relatively new engagement with these idea, with these demographics and, you know, they're moving on to the B for buffer stage, what do you do about it? Um, the, the work that I did with New South Wales local government and shires, um, I can send a copy of that document to Ross and it, it's perfectly fine to, um, to spread it around. Um, they went through a, this really detailed process and it's the only one that I've actually seen do it that, that I've had any knowledge of anyway. And they literally sat down and said, you know, conventional wisdom, or <laughs> these are the demographics, conventional wisdom says this, you know, but this is what we think might happen for us. And they looked at everything from s how many, s how big a cemetery do you need? We're talking 20 years time. Um, yeah, I did some projections on how many coffins that would be for the local <laughs> undertakers. Um, and, you know, and I think from that, I, if I had a thought ahead, I could have actually compiled a list of the major issues that they thought would impact on them. Going everywhere from, from libraries to, um, you know, uh, those things, uh, what do you call them, where you come off your footpath and onto the road? The okay. Yeah. So, so we probably need to stop calling them ramp crossings, really, don't we? Mm. Well, if you look at these patterns. Yeah. Yeah. I think ramp crossings is really the wrong term. Mobility scooter ramps. Mobility scooter ramps.
Greg, could we talk, maybe change tack a little bit, talk about a specific example that we are dealing with at our work uh, over the last year or so, and that is we've got a rural water scheme called Downlands, supplies 2,500 tanks and connection points out in the rural sector, it's quite big. Right? And from a farming point of view, uh, um, there could be some more water for base load, right? because stock farming has changed, intensification, so we're looking at ways of doing that. The issue we've got is if we allow more water for farm use, and that's three quarters of the uses for farming, the other quarter is for lifestyle and housing, how much do we allow for extra housing? Right? And it's really difficult. The committee we have advising us are all farmers. They look like that. You've got to allow plenty for extra housing because we know so many farmers that want to subdivide a lot off to sell for a house lot. But you look at these numbers and you, you've got to start saying where are all these people going to come from that are going to build a house out there? Because I'm not sure it's all the old people are going to want to build a house in the rural sector. It's those That's older right. rural people that want to actually do the opposite. Mm. And so you know, is, is there anyone got any views on that sort of thing? Because it's, it's not easy to get your head around what's the right answer. Because the investment to provide for 20% you know, more consumption, the investment's huge. Right, and there might not be any buyers of that extra water and therefore might not be anyone there to pay for it. I think there's another issue with that too, is that you've got the, um, the tension between what the government so kindly and the National Infrastructure Plan calls productive water, and um, you know, supposedly that water in downwards that's used for farming is in the productive water category, as opposed to um, that that's for consumption. So you could argue the point that the productive water is an economic benefit and the other stuff is a cost. You know, and it will be a cost, but is there going to be anybody out there at all who's prepared to pay for it? And therefore, do we have to advise this committee you know, in pretty strong terms that in fact there's no market for this and we shouldn't actually be allowing for extra um, you know, domestic water? Well, what you're up against in this cusp that I talk about between growth and decline is that most people are so still imbued with the idea of growth that they say, if you don't do that, they won't come. Mm. So. Yes, you know, I agree. you're preventing it, but what? Yeah. It's that bigger picture. It's like, but look, where are they going to come from? Because they don't they've, exist. They they've already born. added yeah. some migration <laughs> into there. Yeah. And um, yeah. If you throw the land use issue into the mix there as well, we were talking about before. Do you actually want all those people living 20 k's out of town, which is going to force Andrew to have to um, put up at the ringing up every second day, complaining about potholes on the gravel road because he put them out in the rural, the, the growth out in the rural sector. And of course, we know about level of service creep, so they're going to want more and more services. They want to see and we're it. struggling already to afford what we can in town. So, do we actually get back to the position where we should be talking more seriously about medium density growth? Because that's a, um, a more sustainable way to provide those services. In terms of lifestyle and box, I'm quite happy about this because if there's a certain age group which goes and buys lifestyle box, mm. and they're there for five years or whatever, and then they want to move back to town. Well, they ring me up and want to subdivide off the house and sell an actual land uh, to someone else. Uh, so, right. um, those people looking for that lifestyle won't be there. No. The, 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 there is no more demand. No, well, and that's, that's what it demand. suggests, yeah. So you mean like they're the ones with the 12 year olds that want the pony? That's it, yeah, yeah. pony and some of the trail ones. Yeah. yeah. And the then when the kids start to want to go out to the nightclubs, they yeah. need to be closer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what Mm. The other important thing to remember is a lifestyle block, you've got to be earning an income to maintain them. Yeah. Mm. Then they're not self sufficient in any yeah. way. They actually they cost a fortune to be honest. They don't look uh, after themselves, that's No. Yeah. Um, and if you're not working, you can't keep one. Okay. Yeah. So you might have lost those damage. You're not recording all that loss. <laughs> I, you know, I, I can imagine these ideas are really hard for people to take on because the, the point is if you don't deliver the service or you don't provide something, then you are, as I said earlier, you know, kissing the kissing your population goodbye anyway. They won't they won't come if it's not there. I think you have to look at some countries that are facing these things further than you when where New Zealand is at or where your region is at. So like I say, Holland and places like that where they're actually engaging with this now um, because we will reach a point sometime over about the next 15 to 20 years where these ideas will be mainstream and what you any major
commitment that you make on future generations taxes to pay or you know repayments on these things um, over the next 15 to 20 years it's like sometimes it's going to be wasted so you know future generations will thank you if you don't um, if you don't invest but in the meantime you're almost like going to be forced to have to make some investments if there's the demand short term now then the people that are currently on the supply are the ones that pay for it instead of having this whole that's going to be paid for by future generations maybe it doesn't need to exist in 20 years time if that's when the if that's when the demand tapers off then it's served its purpose mm. and it can now fail but you need to fund for it and pay for it now not build stuff for perpetuity no not build it for perpetuity maybe that approach needs to be relooked at along with most of the other ways we generate revenue we're always doing it by a very traditional model, assuming that somebody else who takes it over is going to want it. Maybe that's a key area we need to look at. That was all the bums that wanted to do the subdivision. They can come up with it. They're the ones that are going to get the return. It's a very good idea. It's like the forestry roads. You know, they're built purely for the time of the forestry har harvesting, and they're designed to completely fail at the end of it. You know? It's a very economic way of doing it. We're very happy for you to subdivide your farm. We know you're going to get $300,000 for your property, but the cost of servicing and providing them is going to be four hundred. dollars Front up is the four hundred. dollars and we'll let you... <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you fire ahead. Well, it's, it's the same as what Grant was saying about um, people moving back into ta town and wanting their quarter acre section and being able to service that as you get urban sprawl. The only issue with that is, we, as, as I said, we charge contributions to get the fund developing in the first place. And then we assume other generations are going to pay to maintain it forever. Well, maybe that's wrong. Maybe if they want it, and we think they're the only ones that are going to want it, they don't only really pay to develop it, they pay to have it exist into the future. So that at the time when they cease to wish to pay for it, it ceases to be used, and it falls by the wayside. The service is no longer required. So we, well, I think maybe a change of mindset as to how long we take things on for my industry. So I think that's what we talk about is the dynamic nature of these patterns, but we actually build infrastructure forever. And we you know we build it for now with the expectation that it will continue to be used in the same manner indefinitely. And you know, are we actually not thinking about that? So the age management planning isn't actually coming into the infrastructure. It just expects that it keeps going. And it'll always be needed in the same way as now. Yeah, it's interesting. Take this facility here. We were certainly uh, very mindful at the design stage of what our demographics were going to look like in 20 years. You know, this is designed to a 40 to 50 year life because it's shown that aquatic centres wear out because of the environment that we're in. So we said, you know, what's, what's our demographic looking like in years 20 to 30 to give us a clue on what we should allow for? That's why we've got the ramps and, and so on and, and trying to allow for that, the older de demographic that's coming. But trying to explain that to our community when we had some of these public meetings about, you know, we have to allow for the older demographic. This district's going to have twice as many old people as the national average uh, in 1920 and 1925. And it was just disbelievers. You know, it can't be like that. Mm. But all the numbers, and you've reinforced it for mm. me today, all the numbers point to that. And a lot of your tourists will be older too. Uh, tourists, we prefer to call them visitors because visitors. We, we don't have many... <laughs> We, we think tourists are from overseas, visitors are from New yes. Zealand, and you're right, visitors will be older. Mm, well, that, that uh, increase of 98 million across the 65 plus across the more developed countries, um, you know, I used to always sort of say, well, they'd all like to visit this area. Um, and, and across, you know, in, Tas in Australia, 5 million baby boomers will all retire over the next 19 years. They may visit. So, but, you know, that diminishing of the younger population, it's going to, you can understand where they will go to visit perhaps ski fields and, um, you know, maybe the cities, major cities. But you, you used the right term anyway earlier. You said about future-proofing it by uh, making it deeper because yeah. you're ex anticipating bigger bodies in the future or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, f future-proofing would be the sort of term to say to people, well, the demographic will be older. And so you just, it would be a good message for anybody building infrastructure that it should be future proof to, toward an elderly population. Curbs and <laughs> buses and things like that.
and think about the age of your drivers as well. And you know, transport drivers are the oldest, actually the oldest occupation in New Zealand. Road transport, public road transport drivers. Um, Even bus, older than you're talking about grain. bus drivers being the oldest okay. occupation yes. of, the, of the elderly. Yes. Wow. And so we've got pensioners behind the wheels, have we? <laughs> you know, yeah, but it's true. I, Retired farmers drive school buses. Yeah. I think we're. <laughs> Um, well, I thought so. It, it's interesting you pick, pick up on that because I just looked at the cell and had it being different. The thing that comes to me whilst we were looking at those was well, what did that mean in terms of transport? And the two areas that that um, were focused on at cell one in terms of their population um, profile shape and the projections going forward was they actually asked NZ to go for more money around accident prevention in their road safety because they've got a they've got a very high number of elderly people involved in intersection accidents mm -hmm. and we looked at those numbers and we oh no that's only going to get worse. It's <laughs> exactly right. You know, and NZTA actually accepted that that made sense that if you're going to have more of those elderly people then we should start doing things about it now. And the other thing was um, they you know sell one has this sell one star which is public drink, public bus loop into Christchurch and the likelihood of that um, should be um, more adapted to suit the older population as time goes on. So, but just think about how what you can about learning from different authorities. The asset manager, um, Henry Asset Managers Group, actually that was in sort of quite active for a while. Is, is there been any discussion about about getting that going in and trying to? Because in a way, I suppose today is also about learning from each other and sharing our experiences. Uh, no, there hasn't been any discussion, but I guess there could be. I'll put it on my list. Okay. It's, it's, it's good really what was going really good, just that interaction of discussion. I the thought, the thought is if you, if you want to tease some of these ideas out and take them a bit further forward, there's probably more sense to be made out of people doing it together mm. um, as opposed to every single council trying to trying to reinvent that wheel, if you like. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not that different, is it? So. Okay. Actually, based on all that, if you're going to pitch our tourism career, there's the second biggest GDP in it, or whatever it is. We're not going to promote bungee jumping anymore, are we? <laughs> yeah, well, you'll probably have a few people will come bungee jumping, but uh, I'm not sure that too many older people will want that. But those bike trails, um, you yeah. have the bike trail go through here? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible in, in uh, Europe, you know, the tourism, to use the term, um, associated with biking. Uh, whole groups are going off to places like France, even from Australia, you know, going down, doing those bike trails. All of my friends want to come over here and do these ones. There's huge potential there. So that you've got to think about the 65 plus population being broken up into not broken down, <laughs> broken up into um, you know a younger, younger old population, which is going to be looking to do stuff for another fifteen to twenty years. A lot more than yeah. museums, yes. It was Cycling. Cycling. Sort of last week, um, the magazine in New Zealand was all about the motor tackle ice breaking all these multi sport events. There was an article about they said fifty is the new thirty. Mm. Strange, but of course this did attract my interest. And what they were saying was with these multi-sport events, the record times that people were doing when they were 30 well, have been beaten by people who are 40, and they're actually now just having this experience where people who are 50 are actually now breaking the records you know, of younger people previously. And then on top of that, I, I, I was reading the article about the, um, the Hauraki Rail Trail. Mm. And clearly, in terms of the way that was being promoted, it's very flat. Mm. Uh, like it's, it's flatter terrain than the, the others, and they were clearly marketing that to It's the flattest. To come down. It's the <laughs> flattest rail train. You know? It's pretty clear who they're aiming this at. You know? So I thought that's, that's interesting in terms of that active, active ageing population and you know, mm. what, what are their needs? Um, you know, and what are their service expectations that are different to that of 30 years ago? And I don't think we've really even seen it start yet because as mentioned earlier, baby boomers only started turning 65 last year. They 
are really still hanging in the labour market. That's the paper I'm writing at the moment. High levels of participation. But they will pull out bit by bit. They will downsize and down, you know, the amount of time they work and they will want to do those things. So I think there's enormous potential there. And that will happen at a further, further down than what we are traditionally used to. It, yeah, but it'll it'll start happening. Like the things that I'm talking about, I really believe that this that we're in this five years where it will really start to happen. So that and that first wave of the boomers, the ones born around 1946, that is of course the smallest wave of the boomers. They get just get bigger and bigger and bigger every year through till about 1964, the birth the births. So um, you know you've got <laughs> bigger and bigger and bigger cohorts coming through. And so at the moment we're only seeing the very tip of the iceberg. Mm. It's all about preparing for that and saying, hi, we're here and we'd like to do business with you and um, come and visit, but don't necessarily stay. That's another thing. Because, <laughs> you know, because then you have to provide the services. But um, the people in this room are also on this chart as well. Yes. And our industry as a whole generally doesn't have a particularly strong focus on bringing new people into it. So whilst we might be having these arguments now, I wonder who's going to be having them in 15 years' time. In, in local government. Who will be? Still. <laughs> yeah, well, we, well, some of us might be fortunate enough to. But just in general, what, one of the things that we can maybe consider is, is how this industry needs to look out for what it, you know, it's, it's plays a pivotal role in looking after our communities. Who's going to be left to do that? If there is competition for people entering the, the, the workforce, do we have a role doing something about that now? I certainly, I think it's a real issue for particularly our sector groups. And I know like Jean in the past but, you know, worked quite hard at trying to, you know, some of the, I don't know, the, the website, I can't remember what it's called, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, future tech, we're not yeah, future tech, we're oh, yeah. trying to yeah. connect in a different way to actually yeah. people who know, hey, what do you do? What's this engineering and local government about? And you're trying to connect in a more relevant way. But yeah, I think it's a really good point, Dave. If we are, in 20 years' time, what, would, um, what room for the people here will be having this conversation? All the same, because none of us can work for a fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, let's not forget that the ageing population is a lot more IT literate, there's more broadband, there's more connectivity, there's more simulation, there's, there's a lot more that's going to be different to the way we're thinking about it today. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of things that could develop in the interim period that will be the resolution of that. Yeah, and I think they, the issue of that, that, you know, I've turned 65 and now I'm walking out the door. I think they need, that there won't be many of us in, in this room where that expectation anymore. You know, it's, there's a lot more people who we, it's a much more gradual process, I think. So, hopefully, that will help um, in that mentoring of younger people coming through as well. So but you've still got to have the numbers there. Yeah, so, at 65, I wouldn't walk out the door, but I'm pretty sure by 85, I will. Yes. So it is going to happen. Point is, it's That's not, exactly it's not like right. It's going to go away. Yes. It is going to occur. You're not walking out the door. All you're doing is shifting the office space back yeah. to your home. You could literally continue what you're doing at the moment. I mean, you said something earlier about you will not retire. Mm. So, I mean, literally, that may be actually the key right here. In fact, you never retire. You would still be engaged. You still have a steady income. So everything around that fixed income situation and, and, and rates and, and revenue there could be a continuity of, of, of actually steady income. There could be still a, a use of, of your, your experience and, and expertise through, through to the day you die. Except with Dave, we've done some life cycle planning for him and we've actually got the you know, <laughs> date planned for when we leave the whole of them. Far away, isn't it? No, it's all about the projections right. and the assumptions. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, pe people will. People will, I think, increasingly work, but they won't work, you know, they won't work the 70 hours a week, 60, 70 hours a week that they are working maybe well, we at 50 or 60. We're going to work smart. Yes, <laughs> indeed we are. It just suddenly occurred to me that we've shown a lot of the population going through, and then thereafter they put something down. So, I mean, we obviously need to clean up an aging population, but it, it may be for 30 years. For? Yes, I mean, this, this big anomaly has gone through. Yes, that's right, and that's a really important point because when we do these projections, you see, like it takes a brave person to really use projections out past about 20 years. You're talking about people projecting into it, the babies of people who 
aren't really born yet once you go past about 30 years. So we don't really like doing them. But um, those, yeah, that bubble is was a sort of one-off. The, there is the biggest cohort in New Zealand was actually born around 1971. So it's followed by a, it's followed by a wee trough and then a and then another blip, and that's where what my what are called age structural transitions start to come in. So once you get to the end of your growth phase, we've had this big boom go through, then you're going to have these oscillations, and these are what are really going to test you in the future because one minute you can you can just think about it in terms of the the sort of three to eight year old population at the moment. One minute you've got a rise, and the next minute you've got a decline, and then maybe 15 years later they go up again. So while you're busily planning for a, a down, you've got a big wave coming through. It's because of those those oscillations that you get in the size of the reproductive age population multiplied by the birth rate at the time, and, and you know, so they, they wave through. So you're also saying, Peter, so we're talking about this here, but you're saying what happens in this group here is not? Well, we're completely focusing on that, say, yeah. 60, 64 um, So we generally plan on longer term, that's a 30 year block there. And so this will go through. Mm. Um, but there are after. Yeah, it looks it's sort of things, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm just picking up a point there from Natalie where she said specifically, and, and I, I will raise it, these are projections that the accuracy 20 years out, I mean, it could be something completely different. We need to be very careful we lock ourselves into using this sort of statistics for designing infrastructure that has 50 to 60 years life. Mm. You may have a disconnect, and if you get it wrong, it's going to cost an awful lot further on down the track. That's right. But when I say that they are, I mean, projections, you should always treat them, you know, like they can be wrong, but not that wrong. So you're taking it off. How projections are done, you know, they start out single year of age and sex. We know how many we've got. We survive them by going death rates. We add in the birth rates for women age 15 to 49, add them in at age naught make the population one year older, then add a plus or minus for migration. It's really only the migration figure that you're unsure about. Once you start with that base population, it's fairly accurate going out, say, five, ten years. Fifteen years starts to get a little bit hairier because you're multiplying. You had a hundred migrants there, net, net gain, coming in. You know, it might be 150, might be 50. So that can have as you go further, the compounding effect from either having more or fewer people at reproductive age having a child can sort of alter it. So you've got to watch it as you go out. But the context that I'm showing you is the that's the that's the thing that you have to hold on to is the fact that globally, um, especially across OECD countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, you know, we're all we all show the same pictures, all show the same patterns. So I wouldn't go arranging infrastructure for a um, particular number of gain of 25 to 29. What I'd be going on is you're just not going to have a big knot of them to call on. So it's not going to be that much different. So you treat it conceptually as opposed to specifically till we get that population count. <laughs> Um, just one question to, to wrap up because I know that is a plane to catch and the maybe one or two you want to just catch it briefly before she goes. Uh, the census, so we've all got census papers sitting on our on our tables or something at home and we're going to do as many, oh. as many of us Go to, yes. that can do it online as we can, will. Um, when will that data be available? Because I'm thinking forward about the long term planning and asset management planning um, work that people have got ahead of them <coughs> and obviously people will be keen with mustard after the full and that full percent of results. It's usually, it's usually the end of the year. Before Christchurch, Stats New Zealand had on its website that for the 2011 census that they wouldn't have anything available until the end of 2012. They were planning that long because they used to put out census night counts and then they put out usual resident population where they've you know, reallocated people by where you normally live and then you know, fit down the track people who are using these data who don't really know what it maybe goes on behind the scenes. It's like, why has our population declined? It was 
X on the census night, you know, and it's only whatever, whereas your one might be, <laughs> um, you know, 5,000 bigger or something like that. So uh, you can really only use the reallocated data, although in your case you want to use both, because that's where you get a really good count of how, what's your, what's your turn, uh, what do they call it? Churning, population churning. Um, but I'm, I'm, I understand that there won't be anything available before the end of the year, except maybe a total population count 